Good morning, PPTL family. Whether you're watching at home or you're here in our building this morning, we want to give you a very warm welcome. So we just ask you to worship God this morning, to focus on Him, and we're hoping that you'll be recharged for this week to come. This morning, so good to see you. This is the second service for us. Amen. So that's a great thing. Uh, just a couple announcements before we begin this morning. Our AGM is this Tuesday night at 7. And right now we have about 40 or so members uh, pre-registered for that. And we need about 65 for a quorum, okay? So if you haven't registered for that, please do so on our website. Um, and that's this Tuesday at 7. And the reports for that will be available after the service as you head out. Um, also, good tidings will be available as well after the service. I invite you to stand. We're going to read some scripture, and then we're going to worship together. Let's stand. Psalm 145, verse 3 to 6 says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts, and let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. Amen. I will proclaim your greatness. And as we worship this morning, that's what we do. We proclaim his greatness. Amen. So we invite you to worship together. Let's sing, It's Time for the Reign of God. It's time for the reign of God. It's time for the light to shine. It's time. For the kingdom of our God to be revealed It's time for authority It's time for your majesty It's time for the kingdom of our God to be revealed In these days of wars and famines In these days when hearts grow cold in these days of growing darkness, there's a soul. So we gather in the Spirit, we lift up a prayer of faith, we proclaim the mighty Word of God, the power in your name. Let's sing it. It's time for the reign of God. It's time for your life shine it's time for the kingdom of our god to be revealed it's time for authority it's time for your majesty it's time for the kingdom of our god to be revealed for the captives of rebellion addicted and deceived for those who wander far from home, it's time to intercede. So we gather in the Spirit, lift up a prayer of faith. We proclaim the mighty Word of God, the power. Amen. The power, oh, the power in your name. It's time for the rain. Of God, it's time for your light to shine. It's time for the kingdom of our God to be revealed. It's time for authority. It's time for your majesty. It's time for the kingdom of our God. Amen. Let's sing for the captives, for the captives of rebellion. Addicted and deceived For those who wander far from home It's time to intercede So we gather in the Spirit We lift up the prayer of faith We proclaim the mighty Word of God The power in your name The power, oh the power in your name it's time for the reign of God. It's time for your light to shine. It's time for the kingdom of our God to be revealed. It's time for authority. It's time 
for your majesty it's time for the kingdom of our god to be revealed it's time for the reign of god it's time for your light to shine it's time for the kingdom of our god to be revealed it's time for authority it's time for your majesty it's time for the kingdom of our god to be revealed one more time it's time for the reign of god it's time for your light to shine it's time for the kingdom of our God to be revealed. It's time for authority. It's time for your majesty. It's time for the kingdom of our God to be revealed. Amen. You believe that this morning? Amen. That's our prayer this morning as we worship together. Let's continue to worship and sing, Holy is the Lord. Amen. Let's sing this. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Yes, the earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome to see. Together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone
beautiful sense of his presence in the first service and, and now as well. And I believe that those worshiping with us at home, sensing his presence behind the screen this morning. But we declare that today, man, holy is the Lord. God Almighty, above every distraction that we walked in here with, that we thought we left in our vehicles, that we thought we left at home. Holy is the Lord. Amen. Can we sing that chorus a couple more times as Steve plays? Let's sing it. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heaven. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise His unequaled greatness. Praise Him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise with strings and flutes. Praise Him with a clash of cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praise to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Great job, Charlie. Sitting in the service and watching himself on the TV. That's great. Amen. That's good. Technology these days. Amen. We're going to sing this song. It's, I, I would think that it's a very familiar song. But we haven't done it here in a while, I don't believe. But it just says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Feel free to uh, stay seated during the song if you wish. Amen. Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise to the King who 
morning, we're praying for uh, praying for Mrs. Welsh. Praying for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We're praying for unspoken requests that came in this morning. We prayed this morning as a worship team, and, and we said that. As we prayed, we said that. God has not changed, amen? From the very first miracle, the very first healing recorded in the Word, God has not changed. I don't know about you, that brings a comfort to my spirit. That brings a peace to my soul. And in a lot of ways, the world looks a whole lot, um, or looks like to have a lack of peace, doesn't it? You know, we're also praying for uh, Next Gen Ministries that are starting up this week. And a lot of youth and children's pastors are feeling that there's going to be very few coming back or there's going to be an abundance coming back. Amen? We pray for the abundance, of course. But our prayer is, and I say this for Pastor Carla as well as myself, we believe that God's going to impact whoever comes. Even if one shows up this week, Pastor Carla, God can move in a way that can change that life forever. Amen. Do you believe that? Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you. You're such a good, good father. God, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. But Lord, you know that so many in this world today are fighting even to stay alive. We pray for the marriages, God. We pray for the marriages that COVID in a lot of ways has brought destruction in households. But we thank you for the hope we have in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that each person here in the service will experience your presence and the hope that you bring. I pray that each person watching from their computer or TV or even cell phone, iPad, will experience your presence like never before. God, I pray that households are on the brink of being broken. I pray that you would restore them beyond what they used to be. God, I pray that you would bring the, back, bring the church back to our first love. Bring us back to you. God, we pray for the unspoken prayer request this morning. God, somebody notified us that there's a family in dire need of a miracle. Dire need of a miracle. And God, no miracle is too big for you. You are the healer. You're the provider. So God, we pray for that situation right now. We don't know the details. And we don't need to know the details. Because you are who you say you are. And we thank you for that peace and assurance that you are who you say you are. So God, for the rest of this time, God, may your name be lifted high. May your name be glorified in this place. As Charlie read this morning, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. God, we praise you not based on our circumstance. We praise you because you're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing another song before Pastor Brian comes with a word this morning. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. This is a song that Pastor Carla introduced last Sunday. The chorus says, I lift up my head, I sing out a song, and then I'll fix my eyes on Jesus. To the things of this earth, I'll pass away. I'll fix my eyes on Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this together. I lift up my head, sing out a song. I'll fix my eyes on Jesus till the things of this earth all pass away. 
thou fix my eyes on Jesus, oh my soul. And if you are weary, if there's no light in the darkness you the Savior, you'll find the life more abundant and free. I lift up, I lift up my head, sing out a song, and I'll fix my eyes. Till the things of this earth all pass away, I'll fix my eyes on Jesus. Take heart, His goodness and mercy overshadow.
Good morning. It's great to see you. And to those who are watching live stream today, we're glad that you've joined us as well. And we trust that you've been worshiping along with us here in the sanctuary today. You may be wondering who the couple of people behind you are, who, are, who they are, they're new to you. Uh, Leroy has been played once before, I believe, Leroy Freak, and they're part of our church, him and Sonia, and we're glad to have them with us, joined us, and also uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Tuck, who played the bass this morning, and her husband Phil played the bass, I believe, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they've become part of our church as well, so we're thankful for them. Joining the teams, God bless you. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7 today. And uh, I want to talk to you about worship. Genesis 3, verse 1, it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, I believe I shared this uh, personal illustration with you before, But a few years ago, I saw a wonderful illustration of what worship really means. We went through a whole service in the church that we were pastoring, and the presence of God was really powerful in that place that morning. And in this congregation, there was a couple just down to my left uh, that caught my eye, and they were worshiping the Lord intently, probably more than most uh, most of the, the rest of the people that were in the room. At the end of the meeting, I went to introduce myself, and found out that they didn't speak a word of English, but they were totally enthralled in the worship time. And I thought, what a wonderful lesson on worshiping God in spirit and in truth and in the beauty of holiness, and how worship is an attitude of gratitude from the heart for what God has done in our lives, and it's not about anything else, really, is it? In this scripture that we read, uh, we, we know that man was created in a context of worship. He walked in perfect relationship with his creator in the garden, and he enjoyed perfect fellowship with God. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve's rebellion or sin changed all of that. And because of their sin, their relationship and all of man's relationship with God in the future had to be restored. Now, when I say sin, sin is not a word today that our culture would even recognize. If we say that someone had sinned, that would be foreign to, foreign to a lot of our generations today. But sin is simply rebellion. One writer said, the process for rebuilding this relationship was progressive. With each step God took, he was revealing his nature and man's, and he was pointing to the one who would become the bridge between man and God, between heaven and earth. Now, before we go any further, we need to establish a definition for the word worship. Uh, And when we use, and I quote this, when we use the word worship, we are talking about a practice that goes beyond religious ritual. We are really describing man's walk and relationship with God and a relationship that respects God's holiness, His majesty, and His worth. He is worth worshiping, right? And as we look into the biblical text, we find right away a serious problem arising in man's relationship with God. 
Just three chapters into the book of Genesis, we see that sin or rebellion, a deliberate choice of man to go his own way, independent of God, has left its stain on man's relationship with God. And according to the Word of God, man was placed in the Garden of Eden, a paradise where they had dominion over everything around them. It was a perfect, it was a perfect place And Adam and Eve never knew shame and they never knew sin and enjoyed a tangible relationship with God every day. One day, though, Satan came in the form of a serpent. Now, V.P. Hamilton says in his commentary, two things are said about the serpent. First, he says, a word about his character. He is crafty, subtle. This is a neutral word, crafty, and in the Old Testament, maybe either he says a commendable word, you're a crafty person, you're good at crafts, you can make up things, you know, or it can be a reprehensible trait, he says, like they're really crafty, don't trust them, right? That's a negative thing. Second, there is a word about his origin. He was made by God, the scripture says. This point is stressed to make it plain that the serpent And listen to this, I remind you of this again this morning, the serpent is not a divine being. Satan is not a divine being. He might be supernatural, but he's not divine. If you place him in in the divine category, that means he's co-equal with God. But Satan is not co-equal with God. Can I hear an amen? Satan is subtle and crafty. And he comes against you and me in a very tactical way. He has a plan to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Here in the case of Adam and Eve, and I do believe it is no different with us today, we see two tactics of the enemy. Number one, Satan tries to make Eve believe that God is keeping her from something that she should have by questioning God's actual words. Did God really mean, with a question, did God really mean? And secondly, his other tactic is he wants Eve to deny the very word of God in verse 4 and suggest that disobedience won't be a disadvantage, disadvantage, but an advantage because you'll become like God. And even though she did uh, support and defend God at one point, she corrected Satan and said, no, he didn't say we couldn't eat from all the trees of the garden, but he said, she said he did say we had one tree that we couldn't touch. But once Satan uh, uh, deploys his tactics here and makes her believe that maybe God is keeping her from something that she would really like to have, the desire began to rise. The temptation was there, which is probably the first time she sensed temptation. I don't know. And then she said, oh boy, that's right. I could be like God. I'd like to have that kind of knowledge. Well, they listened to Satan and ate from the tree. And as a result, there was a shift, an immediate shift in man's thinking. And a shift in their will which turned from a submissive will to a rebellious will. A will to try and appease their own things, their own desires. Just imagine how Adam and Eve must have felt at that particular time. Even though the tree looked good, and it was very appetizing, and it was very desirous, when they ate and felt the sweetness of the apple, or whatever fruit it was, Uh, They then immediately, for the first time, their lives were not walking in fellowship with God. It severed then. Their relationship with God was immediately severed. For the first time, they knew what guilt felt like. Think about it. They knew what grief was. And they knew for the first time their lives being fulfilled as it was in a perfect garden with a perfect life. They knew in a perfect relationship with God, they knew what it was for the first time to feel emptiness. A great chasm took place, split apart. There was a void that grew. And for the first time, their hearts knew fear. Their life of perfect peace 
was no more. They chose to disobey God. They had offended instead of trusting him. And they worshiped their own desires instead of worshiping God. One writer said this, with their disobedience and rebellion, they were actually saying that God was not worthy of being their authority, and they replaced him with self. I would like to do what I want to do. There's no such thing as sin, because as long as I'm not hurting anyone, then it's fine to do what I want to do. Another commentator, Barber and Shepherd, says, no longer could they walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. What could they do? How could they restore their relationship with God? Could they do something to force God to take them back? They couldn't do a thing. Now they were lost. Just notice the mistakes that Adam and Eve made in dealing with their sin. Number one, they tried to hide their nakedness. Verse 7 says that then the eyes of both of them were opened. Satan knew that that was going to happen. And they knew that they were naked. Who told them? They, nobody told them. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. All of a sudden, with no one around but the two of them, they were ashamed. Why? Because now evil had entered the scene. What a contrast between chapter 2, verse 25, which tells us that they were both naked and they were not ashamed because they were in perfect harmony with their Creator. And then the Scripture says they tried to hide from God, secondly. Verse 8 says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing. Picture this. The man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. Any other time prior to this fall, prior to this rebellion, any other time when they heard their, heard their creator coming and walking among, in the garden in the cool evening breezes, they would run. You could picture them running towards him. But not this time. The man and his wife, when they heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, they hid from the Lord God among the trees. No more relationship. Nothing but fear and shame. And this, when they hid, it seemed to be the first sign of their broken relationship with the Father. What a sad scene. Here comes the Lord for an evening walk and a friendly chat. But Adam and Eve, who have become wise, okay? They're wise now. That's what the devil said. That's what Satan told them. If they become wise, they cower and hide in the trees to avoid being seen by the creator of the universe. What had been a perfect, shameless relationship was turned into a dreadful fear of God. Not a healthy fear as with David, Moses, or Abraham, but a raw terror of being discovered in the wrong. You ever have a fear? Growing up, I had had a, a very healthy fear of my parents. Okay? I grew up in a fairly strict home, my parents being pastors, and, and we were told right from wrong, and, and if we did something wrong, uh, we were punished for it. That's probably not uh, uh, in the vocabulary of a lot of parents today, I don't know, but punishment was a part of my life. I remember throwing a rock at my brother one time and hit him in the back of the head and blood flowing everywhere. Now, I didn't run to my mother and father to tell them that I just threw a rock at my brother and I hurt him badly. I ran away. Why? Because I didn't like the consequences. I had a fear, a healthy fear of what was going to happen. But this here was a similar fear of running away and hiding. And you can sort of imagine what was taking place. They tried to hide from God. They tried to hide their nakedness. And now they passed the blame on. I used to blame my brothers for stuff I did all the time. And they used to blame me for stuff they did sometimes. They passed the blame on. Adam blamed God and Eve. It was that woman you gave me, God. If you didn't give me that woman, 
and Eve blamed the serpent. And both of them had responsibility in this. And even though they had legitimate reasons to blame someone else, they still were ultimately responsible for their actions. And as a result, God pronounced a curse on each of the three guilty parties. We still tend to do the very same thing today, don't we? Same thing as they did back in the Garden of Eden. We try to hide our sins from each other and from God. In your homes, you may be trying to hide some things now. You don't want people to know how, you're, how you live your lifestyle. Maybe there are people in this room here uh, this morning. Uh, uh, you're, you're a believer, but you've done some things lately. You've thought some things lately that you know is not of God. And you can hide it. As I said in the early service, you can hide it with a three-piece suit and a shirt and tie. And you can look like the best Christian ever. You can hide it from the congregation, from your parents, from your wife, from your family, and from the pastor, but you can never hide it from God. You can build all kinds of stuff up around you, all kinds of material possessions, but you can't hide your lack of relationship with God and the brokenness that your heart is in right now. We still tend to do the same thing, as I said. We try to hide it. We also try to blame others for them, for the wrong we do. But the Bible tells us that we will all give an account for the things that we do that doesn't please God one of these days. And that's why it's so important to acknowledge and confess our sins to God. Every day, we need to do that. Adam and Eve's attempt to cover themselves with fig leaves could not cover their guilt, shame, and fear. Their attempt to cover their shame was the best that they could do. They looked for a few big fig leaves and to, to place on their bodies, but it was useless for them. Only God can cover today. Only God can atone for our sins and wrongdoing. I want the musicians to come back and prepare. Physically, you see, God gave Adam and Eve garments of skin, as the story goes. These were lasting leather, it seemed. These garments suggest that an animal was sacrificed, and this sacrifice symbolically spoke of atonement. The covering of sin being the blood of God's chosen sacrifice. And right up through the Old Testament, animals were slaughtered to appease the wrath of God on behalf of the people. Because God, there was still a chasm between God and man because of the original fall of man and the original sin. And there was nothing that was going to permanently close that gap ever until Jesus came. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, He's likened to the lamb, that perfect lamb, because Abel, back in Genesis, as the story goes in chapter 4, he, as he, Abel and Cain, sons of Adam and Eve, and Abel offered an animal, a first fruits, it says, the best of the flock and the first of the flock, and gave it to the Lord, and God accepted his sacrifice because it was the best he had. So then... Hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, God sent His Son. The best that He had. The Son of God. And John one day in chapter 1 and 29 of St. John's Gospel says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This would be the ending of the sacrificial, uh, uh, the, the priestly sacrifices. Once Jesus died, you would not need to offer animal sacrifices anymore because the perfect lamb had done away with the old law and the old traditional law. And so that now man, if they would accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives, could have free access into the very presence of God and talk to him person to person. What a plan. Amen? What a plan. We can have a similar relationship as Adam and Eve had before they sinned. How many times have you felt God come in the cool of the evening or the morning 
and walk into your room as you've spent time in his word and you've wanted to draw close to him and you've sensed the very presence of God. That's because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We walk in here and we worship the Lord. We sense the presence of God. Why? Because Jesus died so that we could experience him through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. The slaughtering of animals may seem cruel and barbaric, but that's because we don't appreciate the seriousness of sin. Sin and rebellion is serious business. The animal substitute is a reminder of our own guilt. I'm guilty. And it pictures the coming substitution of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, we can see that sin is a serious business. And we have to learn, as I conclude this message this morning, that if we are to truly worship God, we must have our sin and rebellion dealt with. And that can only be done as we accept what Jesus Christ, God's only Son, did on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. I don't know if you're here this morning and you need to know Jesus Christ. If you are, you have to accept what Jesus did for you. You have to surrender your all and say, Lord, come into my heart and life. You see, it's simply an act of faith in what Jesus has accomplished on the cross and three days later rising again, and a confession that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Listen to what Romans 10 and 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be what? Saved. That's simple. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And you will be saved. Do that today. Accept Jesus today. You're listening at home in your living room today. Would you do that right now? Just pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe that you died for me and rose again. I give my life to you right now. In your name I pray. Amen. A simple prayer will clean your slate. Will wipe out everything that you've done in rebellion to God. And will give you access into the very presence of a living God who one day is coming back again. Can a sinful person worship God? Well, if you look in Luke chapter 6 or 7, I believe it is you'll see a story of a woman that walked in through a bunch of religious bigots when Jesus was there sitting at Simon's house. And she walks in with all of her sin. People knew who she was. People knew her reputation. It wasn't good. But she walks in when she sees Jesus. And she opens up a box of alabaster oil, perfume. One of the most expensive oils you could get in those days. And people were mumbling around her, oh, they could, she could have sold that. We could have sold that for such an amount of money. And she leans over. She begins to cry, and Jesus says, she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, and then she poured this oil on me. I tell you, her sins are forgiven today. She's forgiven She is more right with God now than you are, Simon. It's all you have to do. You say, I don't have anything expensive like that, Pastor. No, the most expensive thing you can offer God today is you. Give him your life. He alone can see the potential in you. So can a sinful person worship God? Absolutely. You can come to Jesus as you are and confess that you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And then the Bible says, you are saved. You are saved. Because the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's sing together. Let's stand in this place. Let's begin to worship God. You that are believers today, would you thank God for the perfect plan of salvation? Let's just give him our all in worship before we close today. Hallelujah.
softly I want to speak to you at home today if you've given your life to Jesus and you've prayed that simple prayer would you let us know we want to congratulate you and rejoice with you just text us or email us at info at pptl.ca let us know or call us on the phone and the numbers on our website at pptl.ca and we would love to help you on your journey with Jesus Christ. We can give you some literature and we can plug you into a good place with people who know and love Jesus. We pray that you'll just be blessed today. I worship only. If you've given your life to Jesus, you can worship with everybody else today and sing I worship only at the feet of Jesus. Let's sing it once more before we close. I worship only at the feet of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness today. We thank you for the peace of God that passes all understanding. We pray for that peace to be a part of everybody's life. And they will experience you and your fullness today. And as we leave this place, may we go with the very presence of God that we are sensing right now. We walk out of this place, may we be filled with your presence. And Lord, as we come in contact with neighbors and people at work this week, they would sense and know that we've been with Jesus. We love you today. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you for salvation's plan. We give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May God bless you today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope that you enjoyed our service and that you feel recharged for this week. Head on over to pptl.ca and check out the ministries that are restarting this week and next week and make sure you pre-register for the events. Have a good week.